Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome again to Riga Business School. My name is Claudio Rivera. I am the director of the bachelor program in Riga Business School. And uh, we are really happy to have you here today for the second webinar of the Riga Business School Junior Achievement Series of webinar uh, in order to help you go ahead with your student company program. Without further ado, I want to introduce you our speaker today that is Mark Hain. He, he is an expert from Canada in hospitality and in sales. He is, uh, he is a consultant and he is a speaker and he has prepared for you a special presentation with the very, very basics and the most important to take into account at the time of selling your products. Just, uh, just for organization purposes and just a reminder, I, the, the webinar will last 40 minutes. At the end of the 40 minutes, you will have a link with access to a quiz. If you complete the quiz correct, correctly, then you will have a certificate from Junior Achievement Riga Business School. So you remember, if it's the same that in the last webinar, there will be four questions, multi, multiple choice, and if you uh, answer correctly three out of the four, so you will have your, cert your certificate. The quiz will be available till tomorrow, 9 a.m. Latvian time, what is London pl uh, GMT plus two, so it's two hours ahead of London time. Okay, so we, I will repeat these instructions at the end of the webinar. Now I will give the floor to Mark. Mark, welcome and thank you for us today. Thank you so much for having me. This is really great. I, I was asked to do this and got really excited because junior achievement, I think, is, is so amazing. And when, I, when Claudia asked me to present, he said, you know, just tell them how to sell. And as you can imagine, selling is such a big topic. There's so many small components within the title of selling that I wanted to make sure that I give you some really good tips and tricks and maybe a small mythology on how to be able to sell effectively. What's uh, amazing, uh, as I did my research, I, I realized you know, that 30% of the businesses in the USA in 2016 have salespeople that hit 75% of their sales quota. So if you think about that for a second, all these people only hitting seven, three quarters of their quota for the whole year, but only 30% of salespeople are able to hit that high, which to me means that there's a problem. Additionally, on average, 57% of the salespeople in the United States make their quota, but the companies themselves, 92% of the companies out there are increasing their sales budgets. They're, they're looking to increase their sales, and yet their salespeople aren't hitting the kind of budgets that they need to do in order to grow and thrive long term. So today, we're going to be talking about uh, a number of things that will I'm hoping will help you as you start launching your products, you're trying to get your products to market, and... So today we're going to be talking about five different things, uh, topics that we, we need to touch on. The first of is I want to help you define what the purchasing journey is. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer that starting with the end in mind, understanding your customer is probably the number one challenge that you're going to have. Uh, defining a new way to sell. We're going to talk about historically how sales we're done, and we're going to talk about what the expectation is today for selling. And then we're going to look at uh, applying what you've learned so far. Like as you're going through the exercise of building business plans and marketing plans, we'll see how this, the whole sales process fits into all that. And then we're going to have you think about your approach to market. How are you going to approach your sales, the actual process of sales? And then what are the four steps to making sure that you can have some stellar sales? So I'm hoping that's, that's uh, going to help us. Uh, I do believe that you have access to a chat window. So if you have questions, please go ahead and ask your questions. And I will have Claudia to, uh, Claudio to be able to read them out to me and we can answer them as we go. 
as we go through this presentation, I will put in some stops where we can do a quick little check-in to make sure everybody's okay. Are you with me? I, I, I'm sensing that everybody's nodding their heads, which is really great. So we talked a bit about your business plan and your marketing plan. And, and sales fits within that context very nicely. One of the things that you must do as you develop your product is to really think about your markets. And more than likely, if you're building a business plan, you've already gone through this, where you define your target market, where you define what we call the personas, where you go through and you say, what is my target market? What are their needs? What are their values? What are their belief systems? What are their pain points? What are the things that are making them lose sleep at night? What are things that they know they have to overcome their barriers? their pain points. And this is where typically your products will fit in. Products are sold to either alleviate pain points or to create pleasure. Those are two aspects that you're going to be looking at. And then, you know, you have to understand what their spending habits are, what are their priorities, and more importantly, how will you communicate with them? So I'm hoping as you go through your business plan, you've defined some of these criteria. In your marketing plan, You've hopefully got a beautiful little marketing plan going where you have the seven, seven targets of marketing plans. And in there, you're looking at the marketing research. You're, again, playing with your target market. You're going to be looking at your positioning within your marketplace, competitive analysis. You're going to be looking at marketing strategies. You're going to be looking at your budgets and, of course, your metric. And then all that feeds into how you're going to approach your access to your market. And that is looking at how am I going to sell my product? Is it going to be in a storefront? Is it going to be over the internet? Is it going to be direct sales? How is that going to work? And then understanding what is my competition? And a lot of times people will say, well, I have a really innovative product, so I have no competition. Well, the reality is, is if you don't have competition today, you will have competition tomorrow. And so it's really important that as you go look at your approach to market, you know how to handle what's going to happen if you have bootleg products coming into your marketplaces or copycat products coming into the marketplace that will bump your product where somebody is being able to make it cheaper, better, or faster. And then, of course, you have to look at your positioning statement. Okay, so that is just a, a little background of how sales fits into your marketing plan. What I'd love to talk about is, first and foremost, the journey to, um, that, the, that the purchaser makes. There is a defined purchasing journey in every single aspect of a buyer's decision making. And at any point through this journey, you can accentuate and support the buyer through their journey, or you could, they could fall off and no longer want to buy your product. And so it's very easy that you have a buyer will have that initial consideration when they first come to an idea about a product, they will have to consider it. And sometimes the consideration starts the minute you introduce yourself with your positioning statement, where you come up to them and you say, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I sell this to help people like you do this. And that initial consideration stage is an important aspect because it's where you first lay the seeds for your relationship. After that, they go into active evaluation where they start thinking, is this good for me? Should I buy this? Will this help alleviate my pain or will this help me accentuate and build up on my pleasure? And then of course, there's that moment of purchase where they turn around to you and they say, you know what? I want to buy what you're selling. And then the next phase of that, the post-purchasing, and I've had people argue this point with me, is that the post-purchase experience shouldn't be part of the purchasing journey because the sale has already happened. I disagree. And I disagree very strongly because I'm a customer service person. And I know that when you go through the purchaser's journey and the seller's journey, you're building relationships, you're coming together with people, and the relationships don't just close because the sale is over. And the post-purchase experience for you more than anything else is the one that helps you succeed because the post-purchasing experience is where you will build loyalty. This is where you're going to build the love for your company, for what you do, 
and it creates this loyalty loop. So post-purchase experience will ensure that when that person needs to buy again from you, they will buy from you. But bigger than that, they help become your ambassador and they will refer friends and family to your product or service. So the purchasing journey is really important to support. And as we go through our presentation today, we're going to talk about how we support the purchaser's journey through what you need to do as a seller. One of the things you don't want to do as a seller is become this guy. I don't know about you, but there is a big cliche about insurance salesmen, about used car salesmen, about how pushy they are. Nobody likes pushy sales anymore. And it used to happen when you went into a store and then the sales clerk would jump on you and say, can I help you? I got, I got a beautiful sale today. Let me take you over here. Or you walk in to buy a car and they say, oh, we got a beautiful red car for you. And they push and they push and they push. And that becomes a real challenge because I don't know about you, but when somebody pushes that hard with me, I just close right up. I want to leave. I want time to be able to think about what I'm doing. I want time to be able to digest the information I'm getting. And pushy salespeople don't work anymore. There's another way of selling. So this used to be the old way. This used to be the old way of selling for anything. And the downside to this is all the seller is doing is supporting what they want to do. They're su supporting their best interest. They're not supporting the buyer at all. The new way of selling is to become what I call a service seller. The best way to sell something is don't sell anything. You earn the awareness, respect, and trust of those who might buy. And so some of you might be going, what? Don't sell anything? That's crazy. Part of what you were doing in the sellers and the, the path to purchase is we're creating relationships. These days, it is so very important that the seller becomes the subject matter expert. They become a counselor for the buyer. This new way of selling, this service selling, as I like to call it, is supports the, the what I like to call the new economy of buying. It's looking out for the best interest of the buyer first. That means as a seller, sometimes you have to be willing to walk away from a deal because you see what I have doesn't meet the criteria of the buyer. Again, some people will look at me and go, Mark, you should just sell, just sell. If you can sell, sell. But then you turn into the other guy. And that's not what you want. Uh, there is a lot of integrity behind what I'm talking about as being this new way of selling. It really makes sure that the product and the prospect are a right fit. Ultimately, it helps build trust. And over the long term, when you talk about that post-purchase, it ensures referrals over the long term. Ultimately, what I'm asking you to do when you decide to sell your product is live your brand. Customers will always buy the way you sell first before they buy what you sell. And I think that's really important. Customers will buy the way you sell first before they buy what you sell. Okay. So as we go through the whole journey of Working with the sellers, the one aspect that is really important is you really have to define and know your message. It is essential that you know your message. Understanding what your target is and how people will perceive your brand. Ensuring that your message is in line with the needs is absolutely essential. One story that I have for you is this product, Fabrice. I don't know if you have it where you are. But this, is, uh, this has been around since 1996. It is an odor-fighting spray. So basically, if your fabrics smell, you spray this, and when it dries, the, the um, compound absorbs and kills off bad smells. Really great product. 
but there was a challenge. And so what I'd like to do is show you two videos of what happened, their messaging in 1996. We'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll go into the new way that they're selling it today. Getting a breeze through the house is a great way of getting rid of that lived-in smell. But all your fabrics trap household odors. Then when you shut the house up, they start releasing them again, undoing all your good work. But not if you use Febreze. Febreze safely gets to the odors in virtually all your fabrics and cleans them away before they can be released. So there's nothing left to spoil your freshly cleaned house. Febreze stops odors making a comeback. Okay, so they had this ad. They put it out there and you know what? The product worked. They had testimonials that people who had smelly houses were able to spray this on their couch and make their couch smell better. They could spray it on the curtains and make their curtains smell better. But there was a problem with their messaging. When you looked at that video, you'd look, oh, well, that's, that's pretty handy. And when they started selling the product in 1996, even though they had great referrals, great testimonials, people weren't buying the product. And when they investigated why, they would go to some test houses and the housewife would go, oh yeah, yeah, it's somewhere in here. It's in the back of my, oh, here it is in the back of my cupboard. Here it is. And they asked them, why don't you use it? And they said, well, my house doesn't smell. And they kept hearing this over and over again. And they went to a house that had nine cats. And as soon as the, the psychologist walked into the house they could smell that there's cats in this house one of the scientists went into the living room and the strong the smell of cat was so strong that he he gagged and so they asked the the lady says why don't you use the Febreze and she says my house doesn't smell and she's they said you don't smell the cats she goes oh once in a while but not often so in their mind, they were did a couple of things wrong with the ad and the, their placement and their messaging. One is they assumed that everybody can smell what's in their house. And I don't know about you, but when you go into a new house that you've never smelled before, you can smell what's going on in the house. The people living there become desensitized to it. The other thing that they didn't understand was that when people clean their house, people think the house is clean. So when you say, hey, your house is not clean, use this. And they say, well, I've been working hard. I clean my house. My house is clean. I don't need this. So Procter & Gamble had to take a look at what their messaging was, and they had to think of something brand new. And so this is what they came up with a couple of years ago. You get used to rooms smelling of sweaty odors. Yep, you've gone nose blind. You think it smells fine, but others smell this. Use new Febreze Fabric Refresher for your hard-to-wash fabrics. Its odor clear technology cleans away sweaty odors and leaves a light, fresh scent. And to get more than just your fabrics fresh, use Febreze Air Freshener for the air. Discover a few more ways to breathe happy. So again, now they've completely changed the way that they looked at the commercial. One of the things that they've done is they stopped accusing housewives that their houses were dirty. They took a new approach to really build on the emotion of what life is like when things smell great. And in most of their ads, they blame the pet, they blame the children, or they blame the husband for the smell, <laughs> which I thought was really unique because it stops making the wife the victim of bad smell. So it stopped accusing the wife or the, or the housewife, that the reason why the house smelled was because she didn't do her job. And of course, you saw when the mother came into the bedroom, she's got a big smile, she takes a big smell, and, and that became the message, is even though your husband cooks or makes smells, or your son or your daughter makes smells, or your pet makes smells, you can do something about it. And even better than that, you can give them the bottle and say, here, you do it and make things smell better. So they changed their messaging. And then from that point on, their sales for the product just took off. So messaging is really important. So it's really, I, you know, I've taken about five minutes to explain the Febreze story because I think it's really important that you understand how important your messaging is to your customers. And of course, in order to get the messaging across, the number one big key there is 
It's all about communication. If you are scared to talk to people, you must get out and find ways to conquer that fear. Things like Toastmasters, for instance, has helped me be able to conquer my fear of speaking in public. You're going to have to be able to speak confidently about your product and about the benefits of your product and how it will help your seller. So we're going to go through in through four stellar ways for you to be able to sell your product and make it appealing to the buyer in the buyer's journey. Okay, you're with me? Well, I oh, I sense all those nodding heads. Everybody's saying yes, great. So we're going to talk about, first of all, the attraction phase. This is the initial phase where you are driving meaningful conversation. This is where you are working with people to build the relationship. This is where the buyer gets to know you. You get to know the buyer. You are getting the ear of the prospect and being able to figure out if the partnership of buyer and seller is a good thing. If there's going to be a match, you're going to go through and build trust. You're going to develop your, your new business. You're going to research the prospects to make sure that they fit within the target market. And you're going to do what's called qualifying the lead. This is where you're going to gain information. You're going to clarify what is the prospect's problem. And then you're going to discover and uncover how your solution will help them with their problem. Keep in mind that people will buy a product or service from the salesperson once they know that the salesperson understands them. So it's really important that you invest a lot of time and energy in this step of the building of the relationship. If you're selling widgets and the first time people meet you and you go, oh, Jim, nice to meet you. Hey, I'm selling widgets. Do you want some widgets? People are just going to, again, they're going to shut down. You need to understand first and foremost, do they need my widget? Do they have a pain point where my widget will be able to help them? So it's really important that you ask some really good questions at this phase. They're fact-finding questions. You want to uncover what it is the person is looking for. Where does this person fit as far as the personas that you defined in your marketing plan? Is this person a good fit for my product? What's challenging about this is it's asking salespeople to care. And to care, you, it means you have to have a empathy for your, for your customer. In fact, I would say caring is not enough. You have to really, really care about what you are selling, about the customer, about what their needs are. So uh, a quick little check-in. Um, any, how are we doing with this? Is this, uh, is this helping? Is this of value to you? Feel free to write something in the chat window. I have my chat window up. I don't know if anybody can at this point. Just give it another second. Claudia, is there uh, any, any feedback at all from anybody as far as what we've talked about thus far? Fair enough, good. Okay, so just a good way to take a nice deep breath as we go into, because I'd like to talk about the second step of the, of the, um, the stellar, and that is becoming a counsel, uh, a counselor for your product. So here's the thing. I could call this, this is a step that you're going to sell your solution. I prefer to look at it as being counsel a solution. As a subject matter expert, people, you're going to build trust with your customers. You're going to become the subject matter expert. And so people will rely on you for trustworthy information. And this is the phase that the server, that the seller rather, serves the prospect. This is where the service selling comes in. And in order to do that, I have an acronym. You can create some drama. So drama is an acronym. Uh, knowing the prospect's position of the purchasing journey will help you be able to evaluate what, where you need to go with them 
in order to uncover their needs and uncover and take them to the next part of the sales journey. Okay, And the first one is the demonstration phase. So with their needs in mind, you want to demonstrate how your solution will help them solve their problem. Again, I'm going to say, I mentioned earlier, that people buy with emotion and they justify with logic. Anytime you as a buyer, anything, anytime you as a customer go and buy something, you're doing it because your emotional center says it's okay. Afterwards, the logic mind kicks in, and this is where you get the buyer's remorse. The buyer's remorse is after you buy, especially a big ticket item, you think, oh, should I have bought that? Maybe I didn't need it. Maybe I didn't need as big a one. Maybe I could have done smaller. Maybe I shouldn't have spent as much money. And that's the logic brain kicking in after the fact. So what you want to do is you want to be able to alleviate those questions before the customer kicks in with that logic brain. And the reason being is because when the logic brain kicks in, you want them to be able to be happy with the business that they did with you. You want them to go, yeah, you know, I, I did make, I made a great decision. And I know I made a great decision. And it was because of the seller. So really make sure that at this particular point, you're looking for their needs in mind first. Okay. So that's a demonstration, uh, the demonstrate under the drama. The next one is the recommend. Still focusing on the emotional aspect of the selling, you want to make absolutely sure that you make really good recommendations based on the needs of your buyer. Now, I have to warn you, this could be that the recommendation when you see that the product and the, or the solution that you're selling doesn't fit the prospect. At the recommend stage, it might be, you know what, I'd love to sell you my product, but I don't think you're ready for it, or I don't think this product suits you. Now, this is completely counterintuitive to selling, but by being willing to walk away from a deal for the best interest of the buyer, you are going to gain the trust and the loyalty of that customer so that when it is time for that customer to buy your product or fit in or recommend your product, they know that there's you are somebody that they can trust. You are somebody that they will rely on to be able to make recommendations. And the one aspect of recommendations you have to be aware of when people talk about your product or service, they're talking about it because they feel that by talking about it, they're making themselves look smart. That's a very important thing. People will not make recommendations that will make them look stupid at the end. So you're going to make recommendations for your product out of their best interest. Yes, my product can solve your problem. And here's how. Here's how we can make that work. And so we take it into the next phase, which is make it all about them. You want to reinforce that you know what their pain points are at this stage. You have to be able to sit down and say, I understand what you're going through. And I can see, because I know my product, I can see how this will help you. And here's how. And so they really go hand in hand with the recommendation phase and the demonstrate phase. You're taking all three together at this point and being able to serve as their counselor, as a service seller. You're being of service to your customer. And then the next one is measure. You want to prove the measurable benefits of your product. So this is how at the stage at which you justify your product because you can tell your customer, my product will solve this pain point by this much. This is how it's going to help you. This is why your pain point is going to be reduced because of my product, or this is how this my product will enhance your life. This is how my product will make you happier. This is how this will make your house smell better. It'll make you feel so much happier because your life is going to be better and you have to be prepared for that. So basically, ultimately, when you uh, talk about it, you're looking about uh, how your product or service will provide a measurable improvement to eliminate, reduce, avoid, remove or diminish their pain points, or you're looking about where they can increase, maximize, expand, 
strengthen or build on their pleasure or their happiness. So those, that's where you're looking at this, at this stage. And then the last one under drama is, oops, is uh, assure. Is assure. The buyer needs answers at this level. By the time they come close, this is their, their evaluation, where they're in the evaluation part of their, their journey. They're looking for, will this product work? That's the question they're asking. Will it work? You're promising something. Will it work? Is this the best available? Will this still be the best available in the future? So really, this is, these are the emotional questions. If I buy your product, I want to look smart. They're looking for, will I look smart? Will I feel good about my decision? Will I feel good about my purchase? Will my purchase help me the way that you're saying it's going to help me? So it's really, again, really super important that you focus on the emotion of selling your product. The emotion behind what the buyer is going through to say, I want to buy your product. So the biggest question you're going to be asking people is, what can I do for you? Okay. So number three out of the four is to anticipate objections. When people get close to making a decision, you will see automatically this little switch comes on and they start to object. And they object because all of a sudden they are scared to make the decision. The, the objections are like a defense mechanism. This is the last ditch effort to say, am I making the right decision? The prospect is testing their assumptions and they're trying to justify their emotions to buy your product. But they're doing, they're trying to justify it through the emotion thing in their brain, not the logic thing. But the logic is trying to kick in. They're trying to be logical about it because ultimately they want to go home to their family and say, I made a great decision. So at this stage, it's really important that, that uh, you use Strength words, you use words that will help create buy-in. And these are words like as you're talking to people, you say, you know, I understand how you feel, but I think you can agree that my product will help you do this, right? And the minute they nod their head, you've got them. You can ask the question and you say, do you see value in my product? And they say, yes. You say, well, how will my product affect you? And then the minute they say it, the minute they say, well, I can see that it's going to help me do this or this, you have a sale. Because the minute they say it, they believe it. So these are really important questions. Use words like, as we all know, stating a fact, you must agree that. And then the minute they nod, you have them. If they turn their head, well, no, I don't really agree yet. Then you're going back to the drama. And you're going to reinforce that step. I understand how you feel is probably five of the best words you can say to somebody. I understand how you feel. I understand that my product might be expensive, but you must agree that it has value in this or it will help you do this. Do you see that? Customers does this and you're getting the sale, right? When you have a challenge, asking why can uncover the real objection. Why do you feel that way? Can you tell me why that happens? And there's some statistics somewhere that if you ask why five times, you'll actually get to the truth. The first time people answer the question why is not necessarily the, the actual reason why they're objecting. So keep that in mind. And then the next phase, number four, is the close. Everything you've done brings you to this point. You've started the close from the minute you said hi to your prospect. This is where all the previous steps comes together and you're able to then make what they call the close. This is where you're going to finalize that money transaction component. This is where you're going to ask five really important questions, five really important words to your customer. There are five words you have to tell every customer. And those are the words I will tell you after. 
See, I'm keeping you tempted, right? Giving you just enough information to keep you hooked in. We're going to talk about acting. Another acronym, this is the time for you to act. And that is, you have to assume at this junction that the prospect will buy. You've already gone through all the steps. You're at the point now where you've got the nod, the customer was able to verbalize it. You can pretty much assume that the prospect will buy. You assume that you have met his needs as the service seller. So this is where you're so confident that he's made the right choice. You're, you're his counselor. And so you're reinforcing his behavior by telling him what a great, what a great decision he's making. You want to be able to clarify your prospect's position and their pain points. So you want to go back to the beginning of your conversation and be able to reinforce what you talked about as far as these are your pain points. Here's how my product will help you. Isn't this wonderful? And you clarify their needs as they move forward. And sometimes this is the point where you, you know, when you clarify need, if you were buying a car, clarifying the need would say, oh, do you need financing? Would you like extra accessories or this sort of thing is also in this step as well. And then the last one is to testify. Again, this is where you reestate how the solution will help your, your customer. You get them to testify, right? Are you excited about your purchase? You ask them, you know, from what we've discussed, what value do you see in this product? And again, if they say it, they will believe it. And then this is where you need to ask those five words. One question, and it's amazing how many sellers do not ask this question. A lot of people go, yeah, you know, this is really great. I love it. Thank you so much. I'll come back next Tuesday and we can make a deal. And then for some reason, the person never comes back on Tuesday. And it could be when people go home, the logic brain kicks in. They go, uh, do I really need it? Do I really want it? We all buy emotionally and you've just given him a chance to start thinking logically and talk himself out of it. So they, I saw a statistic about these five words. I was talking to a friend of mine who is an absolute professional at selling. And he says, you know, about 10% of people that you come into contact with will buy from you. When you use these five words, you can bring that up to 40%. So think about that for a second. If you have 10 customers, Without using these five words, you'll only get one sale. If you use this, these five words, you will get four sales. Or if you have 100 customers, that's the difference between 10 sales and 40 sales. And it's a very, very simple question. The question is, can I have your business? You must ask for the next step. It is so important that you ask the next step. And this is the one I think that scares a lot of people because I don't want to seem pushy. I'm not saying, are you ready to buy? Sign here, buy now. No, I'm asking, can I have your business? And that makes it so much easier and so much more appealing than saying, hey, good, I have a contract right here, please sign. Can I have your business? The five words that will help really powerful, make your, your sales pitch powerful. And the last thing, it's about customer service. At the end of it, your whole step along the way has been looking out for the best interest of your customer. And once you make that sale, that does not end. You have to remember that. After the customer has bought something, it is so important that you take extra energy, extra time, and invest in your customer. You send them thank you cards. You follow up with them a couple of months into after the purchase. And you say, how did you like it? Is that serving your need? Is there anything I can do for you? Because remember, when we talked about the fact that you are a counselor, you are a service seller, you are supporting their path through the purchase experience. And the one thing you want to do, if you want to be successful, the one thing that you want to do is you want to support that post-purchase experience because you want that love, you want that loyalty, you want them to come back to you for the next purchase, and you want them to refer their friends and their family. I hope that this has been really 
eye-opening for you. I hope that it's been a, uh, uh, some information that you can take home. Uh, but I thank you so much for your time and attention today. It has been my pleasure to serve you. Now, Claudia, I believe you have some questions. I, I do. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I am online. Okay, Could I, I will go with the first question. It's, a, it's quite big, but uh, may, I, I have to look at this uh, camera. So the first one is, could you please repeat the difference between the old and the new way of selling? Sure. So, yeah. Yes, okay. So the old way of selling was as soon as you see a salesman, the salesman jumps on you like he is a vulture. He, all he wants to do is sell his product. All he wants to do is make the sale. He doesn't care about you. That is the old way of selling. That is the used car salesman when you walk in and you're looking, ah, I think I need a new car. And he jumps on you and he says, oh, don't look at this car. Look at this car because this one is so much. And he's talking to you before he even knows what your needs are. The service selling, the new way of selling, is taking the interest of the customer first before you try to sell anything. The best way to sell something is to not sell it. You are becoming a counselor. You are basically selling yourself first. You are proving yourself to be the subject matter expert, and you're proving yourself to be a trusted counselor first before you try to sell anything. Does that make sense? sense? It makes sense. So, uh, so I, I guess that the big difference then is that the main focus of attention is the customer needs and not the product qualities, right? So you first try to understand what the customer needs and then try to see whether your product match or how you can advise the person to go further and look for other products, right? So it's the Absolute, absolutely. perspective it, is different, right? Yeah. It's, it's really investing your time with the customer to focus on their needs first. Very good. Another question is, uh, in your practice, do you generally prepare a standard pitch for your products? Do you have something at hand? Uh, and I guess the context of this question is because most of these pupils that are listening to the, the webinar, they will be in fairs, where you have, you know, the, 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 they present the products in a small booth, a stands, and then, you know, it's just uh, some people will be walking through and they will try to see whether some of these products are uh, suitable or not. So they will have very short time to present something. So do you okay. have, do you have do. a standard sell, sell speech that you use for this? So what you need to do, if you're going to be in a trade show booth style, you need to have what I call a positioning statement. So a positioning statement is a really powerful statement that describes who you are, who you represent, who you serve, and how you help them. And so very simply, it goes like this. My name is Mark, and I work for Essential Hospitality Solutions. I help companies who want to... I help companies who want to build hospitality into their system to make sure they serve their internal and external customers. So when you are in a trade show, and I think if I can, if you can uh, give me two seconds, I actually have um, a slide I can show you here. And I hope you, you bear with me because I, uh, I didn't know if I would have time to cover this. So here's the formula. So if you want, take a screenshot of it, but here it is. The formula for a good positioning statement is to say who you are, who you represent, who you help, and what you're helping them to do. Okay. Now, keep in mind that this is who and what. We have not talked about why. The why will come when people go, oh, wait a second, that you're speaking to me. That's the problem I have. So I want to know more. And so now you've created a positioning statement that gets them to ask, well, how do you do it? And that's where you go into your process or you go into your, your um, pitch. This is a really great statement for introducing who you are and what you do. 
So for instance, the second, uh, the second example there is, hi, my name is John with Sleep Ease Blankets. We help people who are cold to get warm and stay warm all night long. So if somebody's selling some sort of a microfiber blanket, or this is a great way for people to go, oh, wait a second, I'm always cold at night. Tell me more. Does that help? So the, I trust this is my, my, my own comment. The last speaker in the last webinar, the, when he introduced the business idea and how to pitch the business idea, he emphasized that the objective was to get a second meeting. I guess with the positioning statement, it's about keeping the person in the booth, in the stand, to continue talking, right? So that you raise the, the attention, so that the person wants to stay a little bit more and explore the, the and actually the, the one of the mistakes I have usually seen is that the the, peop, the the sales people try to go too much into the details at the beginning without trying to understand whether the person wants to actually go on and, or not, right? So right. And so this is a quick way we talked about personas at the very beginning. And so this is a quick way to filter through your personas. Because somebody who doesn't need a blanket We'll just go, oh, that's great, and they keep walking. So this is a really quick, you know, they say an elevator pitch should be 90 seconds. This is much less than 90 seconds. This is a very quick statement, which will help you qualify your, your product or your customer because you're telling them something, and if it resonates, if all of a sudden they go, well, wait a second, that speaks to me, tell me more. Then you are able to then give them your elevator speech which is under two minutes, you give them a brochure, you give them product, and then like your previous speaker said, you can then set up a second meeting, you can then set up a meeting where you can actually sit down and start that buyer's journey and take them through the buyer's journey. One very practical question, how much time do you need to devote to prepare a sales pitch or a positioning statement? Yes, for the sake. So, uh, I mean, my, time do so you... here's, here's my cop out, um, as much time as you need. Um, so using this formula, you could pretty much figure out what are the words that I need to do to create the emotional connection. If I give you a spray, so if I sell you this spray and I say, I have a spray that will get rid of the odors in your house, that is one way to talk about it. Or I can turn around and say, my spray will make your house smell fresher. It'll help make your boy's bedroom smell better. And because of that, you are going to be happier. That is a much better positioning statement than I'm going to get make your house smell not so bad. <laughs> so you take as much time as you need with it. But here's the formula. Yeah. I had a question here that uh, I saw in these trade shows uh, of junior achievement. You know, you have hundreds of booths and there is a lot of noise around and something I have seen very useful is that some of them come with an iPad or another screen and then they show they demonstrate the product so you can see you know in a very short video what the product does and, and with some mm -hmm. products that are non-traditional they are not so traditional so that that helps the buyer immediately to understand what the product is you know? so what do you think about it? Well, you have to do, you know, when it's a trade show booth, you keep in mind that if everybody shows a 30 second video and you have a hundred vendors there, uh, it's going to take, people are going to get overwhelmed by the information. It's kind of like the way the internet works now with all the different ads and everything that they push at you all the time. People get overburdened by it. You, if you have a trade show booth, you need to do something compelling to your booth that makes people want to stop and go, oh, that for me, I think is the big power behind a trade show. What is your attraction level that's going to make people want to stop and take the time to spend with you as opposed to your neighbor? If you have 100 people at a trade show booth, people, uh, attendees will fly through a lot of, they'll take a lot of time at the beginning of the trade show because, you know, I got two hours, that's fine. But when they only talk to five people in an hour, the last few booths they are going to have to fly through because they're going to run out of time. So you need to do something that is visually compelling in your booth. So as people are walking by, they can see right away, it's like, wow, that one is different. I'm, I need to go there. 
as opposed to looking like everybody else. Yeah. So think about how your booth is going to look, how appealing you're going to be able to make it. What can you do to interact with the people coming to your trade booth? And it is so much easier when you have a bunch of people around your booth to talk to five or six or seven people rather than talking to one person at a time. And so the iPad idea is great for the follow-up. After you give your position statement, somebody goes, oh, I want to learn more. Oh, great. Here's a little video. Meanwhile, while you're watching the video, I can now talk to a bunch of other people about my product. Actually, but don't use that as your primary sales tool. Yeah. Okay. That's a good comment. And I, I see one comment that you crossed through there, and I, I would like to emphasize to the viewers, is the design of the booth is very important, right? So very. how elegant it is and that also the message of the booth, of the design, is connected with the product. Because it's ha I have seen some cases where the booth is very good, but then when you get close, the product is not actually connected. Um, or at least, uh, I mean, it doesn't really directly connect with the product you are selling. Uh, but that is a very important part of this. And what about shy, shy, you know, uh, visitors? You know, they, you have the, the typical people that are walking, but they don't have the courage to go and talk to the people that are in the booth. Do you suggest to get out of the booth and stop the people or mostly to stay and then let's see who is coming and talk? You know? That is a great question. What I would recommend, usually you have a booth that is in a square and the table is at the top of the square and then everybody stands behind the table. What I would recommend is you move your table to the back or to the sides and you keep your booth open. If you're working in a trade booth, stand in front of your table. It's like inviting somebody to your house when you have a trade booth. You want to stand in front and you want to be welcoming Keep in mind, you are the service seller. You want to be able to make eye contact with people. You want to be able to say, hi, good morning, how are you? And the only way that you're going to engage people who are shy is by making eye contact and smiling. First and foremost, people are going to be, oh, I don't know. You know, I don't, people don't want to be sold to. So the one thing you need to do at a trade show is by using your position statement, you want to reinforce that this person has a need or doesn't have a need, right? So being able to turn around and say, hey, I'm with Sleepies. We help people who are cold at night get warm and stay warm all night long. And people go, oh, that's nice. Great, thank you. And they keep on walking. But other people will turn around and go, wait, tell me more. And so that's where you have the big smile. You have the presence. You're in front of the booth. You're not behind a table. And you're definitely, definitely not sitting. Thank you so much. Uh, and you know, uh, and as a side note, because I have been in many of these trade shows, uh, what Mark is saying that you you will need to be very active. Every, every you will see a lot of people coming to your booth, and the, and the trade trade show lasts uh, around eight hours. So you need to sleep very well the previous night. You need to have very good energy because uh, you know it really takes a lot of energy to be there so that's my experience and that's what i have seen in those in those trade shows so have a good break a good rest the, the night before that you can really be energized during the whole fair we have to go close in market i am very very grateful to you so uh, I, I i guess this will be very useful to a lot of the kids that are going to participate and pupils during the next two fairs that we will have, one in March and one in April. And, uh, re and, and just a reminder to all the participants, you have time till tomorrow 9 a.m. Uh, Latvian time, so that means GMT plus two to fill the quiz and then get uh, a, cer a certificate of participation uh, signed by the Dean of Riga Business School and with the logos of Riga Business School and Junior Achievement. Thank you, Mark, and have a wonderful day. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for the time. Good luck, everybody. Hello, Mark. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome.